Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. I know that you know there's going to be a lot of digesting, and, and everyone's going to have that like after lunch sluggishness going on. So um, we're going to you know hopefully liven things up a little bit and kick things off with the most rapid fire panel you've ever seen. Um, so we had so many submissions to our lovely little DevNet Create conference that all our 40-minute slots, we thought actually we'd prefer to get more speakers on than our 20-minute slots. So um, please do give it up to these wonderful, wonderful people who are willing to try and fit a panel into 20 minutes. Um, you know, energy is probably what we need after lunch. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Val um, and, and introductions and take it away. Micro introduction. So thank you, Matt. I'm Val Bercovici. I'm the former CTO of the Solid Fire division at NetApp, a storage company. I'm the founder of an AI company focused on data center supportability, and I'm moderating your lightning panel here. I'll let Mark introduce himself, and we'll follow on down the line. Hi, I'm Mark Teeley, CIO and CSO at uh, AppSera. We're a container management platform right here in San Francisco. I'm uh, Stephen Day from Docker. Um, I work on ContainerD and OCI and SwarmKit and various other projects there. I'm uh, Mackenzie Burnett. I am a product manager at CoreOS. Um, and I joined CoreOS through the acquisition of my company, Red Spread. And um, CoreOS, we build um, Kubernetes and container ecosystem open source projects and solutions. So this is, uh, by and large, the CNCF, the Cloud Native and Compute Foundation panel. We're all members. And one of the, I think, opening questions I always like to talk about here is almost everyone knows Kubernetes. It's one of the cornerstone projects of the CNCF. I'd like each one of you to discuss another project, probably ideally within the CNCF, that you're working on and, you know, what's cool about it? Yeah, for us um, at AppSera, we're still relatively small, but uh, where we're participating and hoping to participate more is with uh, our own introduction of NATS to CNCF. Uh, uh, it's a uh, messaging platform. And uh, still nascent, uh, but uh, we're in the process of productizing it now from a usability standpoint, so it's getting very close. But that's where we're spending most of our time. And, and the reality is is that uh, we'd be spending more time on other projects if it wasn't for the fact that our own product competes with some of those projects. And it would be fair to categorize Nats as pub sub on steroids, or? Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, that would be cool. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, I work on ContainerD, so I'll, I'll leave that one off the table. But um, the other two projects that really excite me are Prometheus and Open Tracing. Um, both of these two projects can help with the observability in your distributed systems that we're creating with containers. So um, hopefully those can help to uh, basically, we, we have this problem where we, we wonder what these things are doing in these giant clouds and, and both of those projects will help us uh, to, to better run those things, to better understand what they're doing from both a metrics perspective and then also a tracing perspective. So those, those are the two projects that really excite me. Oh, you took my answer. I was gonna say Prometheus. Um, well, because CoreOS, um, we, we uh, employ several of the, the key developers of Prometheus, and it's a core part of, um, of our, our um, efforts in contributing to um, monitoring upstream. But um, I guess I'll talk about Rocket and, and ContainerD. Um, those are two um, projects that um, were kind of donated around the same time, um, CoreOS and um, Docker, to the CNCF. Um, so I'm excited about all the increased uh, opportunities and options for people out there for running um, running containers. Excellent, and just a warning to the, the organizers in the back there, the countdown clock is still stuck on 20 here. So, okay, there we go. So I don't know if I have three or four minutes of free time, but uh, we'll just carry, oh, there we go, it's down to 17 something now, so the race is back on. Uh, so let me maybe take it up a level, and before I do that, uh, we are certainly open to audience questions. Uh, we don't necessarily have to shuffle mics back and forth. If I can hear you, I will repeat the question for the camera, and we will be able to address your questions as well. So let me, cool. So let me just tee another one up, and then all you geniuses think of some good questions to ask us here. Um, in terms of not just technology, but you know, Mackenzie, last time we were on a panel together, I thought you had a fantastic answer to, what are some of the new business, perhaps disruptive business models that containers are enabling their users that might differ from traditional open stack or virtualization or more even, you know, more legacy client server deployments? Oh, I should say the same answer. Um, yeah, I, well li <laughs> I liked it last time. <laughs> um, well, um, I think uh, if I remember the answer I was talking about um, was, well, now I have two in my head that I'm thinking about. The first is um, thinking about what I do every day, which is um, at CoreOS, we're 
rethinking how open source, how you can build sustainable companies um, with open source. And I think the two traditional business models are support and services, or you have sort of an open core proprietary layer model. And um, the problem with the first one is that it's, as a, from a business perspective, it's pretty low margin, right? You have to have a lot of people. Um, it's really time intensive, really people intensive. Um, and the second, the problem with the second, um, at least the way that we see it, is that it, it creates sort of bad incentive structures because um, the companies that build open core models are never really incentivized to improve um, or to bring value back into the open source project if they can sort of siphon away that value and package it up and sell it to a company, an enterprise company. And so sort of the third way that, that CoreOS is building, and we started this with Container Linux, is um, by focusing on sort of the cloud ops or the, the automated ops layer. So um, software, which we call operators, which know how to auto-maintain um, other pieces of software. And so, for example, with Container Linux, um, we're able to do this with the Linux kernel um, through core update. And then with Kubernetes, we're able to do this through um, something that we call um, self-driving or, or um, self-hosted Kubernetes, where we're able to drop in pieces of software called operators that know how to do no downtime rolling upgrades of, of Kubernetes itself. And so um, that's something I think is, I don't know if that was the same answer, but that's something I'm thinking about. Um, and the second, the second um, business model that I'm excited about is that I think I, I and I don't know what businesses will pop up because of they're able to better um, have faster deployment and delivery or they're able to um, take advantage of uh, massive scale and you know changes in in their traffic um, but I imagine that there are a lot of companies that that will be able to be built in the future that weren't be able to be built you know 10 years ago in the world of VMs when when infrastructure was much more static and you had a plan for um, for infrastructure uh, like um, that you know couldn't handle as much um, traffic and so I'm excited just to see that's the sort of the unknown um, but I'm excited to to see what companies will do with Kubernetes more than I am excited about talking about <laughs> Kubernetes um, itself. Yeah, it was the second one actually that was pretty cool. Go ahead, Steven. Oh, business models? <laughs> you know, what, what, what cool things that really have, you haven't seen before are you seeing companies do with Docker? So, well, I mean, one, one area is, is ARM um, and IoT devices. This is something, an area where the, the tooling is um, less developed because you're, sitting, you're you're targeting many more platforms and many more possibilities. So, um, and, and that community is very very uh, kind of maker esque. So they're they're willing to hack anything onto anything. And I think seeing that spirit uh, uh, be encouraged by in con uh, containers is an exciting thing to do. Um, I have no commentary on the business models, but uh, hopefully that we can we can see companies leverage the, leveraging this in. Uh, uh, in 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 innovative ways um, enabled through the in, enabled through the container ecosystem. So there's the the OCI image form, uh, format, for example, is very very flexible. So I think we'll see a lot of creative solutions that involve that um, and can target various different platforms for um, in ways that uh, they particularly view their their workloads. So. So for me, um, the value of containers in general, uh, from a business model standpoint, uh, resolve around a revolve around a number of things. Um, from an opportunistic standpoint, containers couldn't have come at a more important time from a, um, a trend standpoint in IT. Uh, when you think about IoT, when you think about ML and, and AI, um, any of these um, edge-oriented capabilities consumed by uh, a exponentially larger numbers of customers in smaller bytes, containers are an obvious answer for that, as is serverless going forward. So uh, the opportunity from a business model standpoint, as was mentioned earlier, is that there will be um, enormous number of new business models created where the barrier to entry because of the use of containers is much lower than any technologies before that. And that's been a historical trend within IT, whether it was mainframes to uh, minis to towers to blades to VMs to now containers, these trends have been required in order for us to meet the demands of IT going forward. From a personal perspective, what I'm excited about relative to containers is that, um, and pardon me, but you don't have to give a crap about containers. You can actually help yourself or you can help a customer make a major move to 
modernizing their ability to own and manage their infrastructure as a result of containerizing even legacy platforms without having to refactor them, without having to tear them apart and rebuild them again, which most organizations can't afford to do en masse. Um, and that drives innovation back into the organization um, by lowering cost of ownership and giving them opportunities to deploy in ways that they wouldn't have been able to deploy using traditional infrastructure. And, and I'm, when I say traditional, I am including VMs. I actually have something to, to, to tag on to that. I think um, another way, a layer up, than containers, so like Kubernetes, for example, um, can change the way that businesses consume easy to manage infrastructure um, is that a lot of the benefits that historically um, pass offerings, and, and Mark, maybe you have some commentary on this, um, pass offerings um, you know, could give, like you, know, you don't worry about your infrastructure, just worry about your apps. Those are kind of combined the, the promise that containers and Kubernetes give, because containers has so much, uh, or because Kubernetes has um, so many features now, like um, service discovery or, or, or um, self-healing or you know, auto-scaling that um, traditionally you would really only get in past products that really ease the, the burden of operating infrastructure um, from the end user. Um, and it's, it's free because it's open source. Um, and so I think that is something that will change the way moving forward has already been changing the way that, that people think about how much money they need to spend on infrastructure or allocate budget for, the, for that. Very cool. Any uh, audience questions? Go ahead, sir. Let me just quickly repeat that. You know, you know, you're a straight man, actually. It's one of my favorite topics, the state and storage and data. Uh, so the question is around state management in a container context and how it probably requires some different approaches, particularly to be true to the dynamic orchestration and so forth. So anyone care to comment on that? Well, the joke answer is, but containers are stateless. Um, well, so I think the, the, the key there is to pick a... Um, so let, let's let's step back. So if you look at the Hadoop ecosystem and you start wondering, well, what what made that popular? What made that happen? And you go, well, was it the MapReduce model, or was it you know this thing or this thing? And and if you and if you look at the common um, piece to it, it was the distributed file system. Um, so what the container industry really needs uh, that it doesn't quite have yet is the common distributed file system, which for Hadoop was HDFS. So without that, what do you do today? I think, I think for your organization, the, the best thing to do is to pick something and use that and get good at that and understand, and if, and if a solution comes along that the container ecosystem uh, provides and it's, and it's great and you can compare it and you can move to that or you can continue with that solution. So, uh, you know, it really depends on if you're in the cloud or if you're on, on premise and I don't want to make any recommendations, but yeah, so, so I, th I think picking, um, you know, try, trying out a couple of different solutions and seeing, and seeing where they land is, is the best approach. Um, uh, coming down the, uh, uh, like, there's the CSI, which is the Container Storage Initiative. I would watch that closely because I think that will have a great effect on container storage solutions. And, um, and, and there's, uh, you know, there's also a couple of open source projects that, that are out there that, that you can take a peek at that, that have varying different solutions. So, um, does that cover everything? Yeah, this is kind of a, a frothy space for startups as well. So there's a number, uh, you know, I can talk to you about offline if you're interested. I would also say that some of the old adages of the 12-factor manifesto in terms of using a, a single, well, not a single, but a, a well-defined API for a backing store. Uh, Kelsey Hightower used to say in the days before pet sets and stateful sets and volume semantics and Kubernetes that just network storage, you know, is that any node can access is, is not a bad way to start. Seems to be a bit of consensus here on the panel for that. Um, any other? That was a great opening question. Any other audience questions? I'll give you one more, sir. You got here. I'll give you the mic. You're, you're close enough. No. Uh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my next question is: So uh, we deal with a lot of customers in both uh, uh, Linux and Java spaces, as well as a lot of customers in the Microsoft and .NET spaces, and where we're seeing a, a, um, a lot of lacking from uh, products like Kubernetes is, is in that. Microsoft space, or are you guys making any headway in that space, and are you looking to expand into that environment set? 
Yeah, I mean, um, I'll, I'll start, and then I, I know that you guys have, have done a lot of work around um, .NET apps, right, and Windows support, um, but it's definitely a, it's definitely a um, an area that the Kubernetes ecosystem is looking to grow its um, its offerings, and I think, um, for example, Brendan Burns moving, um, you know, who was one of the architects of Kubernetes, moving to Azure to really lead up a lot of their um, Kubernetes and container initiatives on Azure. I think is a and um, Microsoft acquiring Deus um, and having. Um, having their leadership there um, really direct a lot of their container initiatives is a really good sign because it means that um, you know, two of the key players in the container um, or in the container and Kubernetes ecosystem have are directly working on those problems at Azure. And I know that um, when when we just an example a small example is that when at CoreOS we were looking to support Tectonic on Azure, um, Tectonic is our enterprise Kubernetes um, uh, distribution. Um, we uh, the Azure team literally came to our office and like hacked with us for two days, right, to like get you know get it working on Tectonic. I mean they really are interested and in, and there's a lot of collaboration there between the Azure team and the Kubernetes ecosystem. Um, so the answer is that yes, we're aware, but definitely um, looking to expand that since it is such a massive market. Any other Microsoft related comments, Azure related comments? So uh, yeah, when Microsoft says they love Linux, I believe them. Um, they I love that sticker. It was like, the sticker was like the most, like, it was like the epitome of like a 10 year like war, you know, it was just like, like in a little sticker. <laughs> Yeah, so, so I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be able to comment too much on Kubernetes. I have every confidence like that their model can uh, distribute work to uh, Microsoft workloads. The, uh, the real work right now, um, at least for that, that I see, is, is happening in making the Windows experience uh, on par with, with, the, uh, with the Linux experience. So there's a lot of work in getting the graph drivers to behave that uh, the right way, getting the networking to behave the, the way that we expect from, um, we'll say, Docker, uh, and then also um, you know future container models like like with Containerd. So we're doing work in, in there as well to make this this ex to bring to bring the same experience to bring the, the be able to relocate your workload without caring about it too much. Um, so uh, another another project is, is SwarmKit, and we have a very similar like like node announcement model that that is able to say, hey, I'm a Windows node, and you can schedule workloads. And for the most part, it's it's uh, it's invariant to the particular operating system that you're on. As long as you can run the image, it works. And um, I don't see any reason Kubernetes won't be able to do that in the future. It's really the the run times that are kind of holding this back. And not 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 too badly. So, and, and Microsoft is working on this, and I expect to see um, a very interesting set of uh, deployments in the future. So will it convert converge into a service fabric, a single service fabric? I'm not really familiar with what a service. What you mean by a service fabric? Is that a specific? I mean, if it makes sense for them, I would I would guess so. But I, yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, well, we'll talk about Linkerd later. So uh, there's um, time for one more audience question or a closing question. I have. Is there? A, go ahead, ma'am. I'm not hearing. I'll just I'll come up closer. Oh yeah, help. Thanks, ma'am. Sorry, I'm not loud enough. Yeah. Since this panel is on cloud native, I'm, I'm just curious to hear from some of you um, on the enterprise segment, where do you see some of the biggest opportunities for this open and premium kind of business models? And uh, you know, what are some of the key verticals also where you're seeing some of this adoption taking off? No, no, I think you shared them. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm not positive I got the question entirely, um, but if I understood it correctly, you're asking um, what are enterprises doing from an adoption standpoint? Where do we see opportunities versus risks, et cetera, right? Um, one of the, and verticals, yeah. So, I mean, speaking for us, uh, we don't actually have a specific vertical. We're seeing it coming from across the board, but, and this may be, 
counterintuitive to a room full of folks that are here because of open source and containers, but the average enterprise still doesn't know how to spell containers, right? I mean, they want containers, they've got developers playing with containers, but less than 1% of the apps in the enterprise today are in production on containers. That doesn't mean there's not an opportunity, there's an enormous opportunity, um, but most people are still stumbling over, do I just wrap it in a container and put it in cloud? Do I have to refactor it? Is wrapping it even an option? Uh, what do I do to get, how do I get out from underneath the legacy burden I've got right now in order to work on innovative opportunities that might include containers, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and we have to keep in mind that for us, the idea of containers, the idea of Kubernetes, the idea of AppSera, the ap idea of Docker, it's all like, wow, that's a shiny object. Let me go chase it. But in an in enterprise, there has to be the why first. The why might include containers as part of the solution, but containers are not the solution before you have a why. And so that's really the, from a CNCF standpoint, um, and from a vendor standpoint in this space, whether you're an integrator or a, somebody selling software or open source into that environment, that's the biggest hurdle, is, right, is really how do you get started? Because it's sort of, in, in this space right now, it's sort of like the first cars. Yeah, the other, the other panelists, the other okay, sorry. Uh, well, so I think the the biggest I, I'm going to address the, inter, the enterprise adoption. I'm not super familiar with the verticals and the businesses and whatnot. I'm, but um, but the the main the main thing stopping enterprise adoption is a lot of the best practice in um, that are suggested in containers are around like change the way you write your app so that it fits into the container model, which um, isn't great because like it's like well I don't have time or I don't have a team or like. I can't compile this anymore. We compiled it in 2007, and that's it. So uh, we have to find a way, find models to make it work. So there, you know, there's there's tools to you know take existing applications and repackage them in containers. I, uh, there's like a VM where it's called Image to Docker. Or something. That's an example of one that 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 does that. And I think seeing more of these projects that can help existing enterprise workflows, uh, like work in the container space, is where this is going to be. Where where, where we're going to see that more of this happen. Yeah, I guess I'll I'll close and just say that while we haven't seen, I think none of our, the panelists have really seen um, specific verticals, industry verticals, where this is um, cloud native adoption or Kubernetes or container adoption is really springing up. Um, my personal theory is that the um, where I've seen actually the most commonality is um, industries that care that either have really, really low, like a lot of competition, where they need to be able to optimize on developer workflow or speed of development. Like that's that is important enough that they would go through entire infrastructure rearchitecture in order to get that you know one or two percent speed gain, um, or you know twenty percent or whatever um, they end up getting. And um, the second is um, industries where. Uh, there is a lot of volatile scale in, in workloads. Um, so um, Ticketmaster is a CoreOS customer, and they, I mean, like, they literally just DDoS themselves every time there's a Jay-Z concert, you know? <laughs> it's just like, the spike is insane in terms of their traffic that hits their website um, at random, you know, they can somewhat predict it, but they don't know how popular certain concerts will be. Um, or financial services is another one that, that handles that type of stuff. So there are some common reasons, I think, why, why initial company or verticals start doing it, but there isn't like an overall trend, I would say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I think considering the 20 minutes, that was, uh, that was pretty happy. Is everyone feeling a bit, a bit more awake after lunch? Everyone digested? Everyone thinking, damn, I should have got one more Coke from the, from the little breakout room. But anyway. Um, next up, we have Michelle. She's from uh, Pantheon Systems. And she's here to sh talk to us about the lessons learned um, with you know, their kind of moving from um, their old deployment model into Kubernetes, working with PHP, and kind of the lessons learned around that. So um, by all means, take it away once we have some HDMI and some video. Do you know what? I am going to move some chairs in the meantime. No. 
Excellent. Whew, that was exciting. Wow, it is freezing in here. I am glad I get to walk around. Can you see me okay? I'm waiting to see my slides up here. Then thumbs up, let's go. All right. Hey everyone, I'm so excited to be um, speaking here. It's cold, so I'm gonna uh, do a lot of uh, kinesthetics if you'd like to join me while I'm talking. Um, so uh, the, the last panel made an assumption that um, everybody knows what Kubernetes is, um, et cetera, and that, um, I, I am not going to make any assumptions that anyone knows about Kubernetes or anything. This is a real, uh, this is a use case about how um, we're using all this, these things. So hopefully I hit the sweet spot of being uh, both too technical and not technical enough to really maximize the level of disappointment. Um, my name's Michelle Krejci. I'm a warrior princess, but I'm also a software engineer. Um, I work at a company called Pantheon Systems. More on that in a second. Um, I get really excited when anyone follows me on Twitter. Um, it does something for my ego. Um, uh, really happy to be here today. I work for a company called Pantheon, um, and we specialize in managing and hosting PHP apps, specifically Drupal or WordPress. Anyone heard of any of those? Yeah, cool. So um, PHP, obviously everyone's favorite language. Um, don't disrespect your elders. There's a lot of really great sites that deploy um, PHP apps, a lot of content management systems, a lot of universities, a lot of hospitals, a lot of really content-rich systems. Um, here are some of the cool logos that we get, we're proud to host. We have about um, 250,000, uh, 300,000 uh, um, sites that we host. Um, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about a use case. Um, at the end of uh, January, um, President Trump signed an executive order to um, prevent people um, who already have green cards from entering the, the country. Um, and this created chaos. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers this. There were protests at the airports. There were lawyers showing up to airports, and those lawyers were from the ACLU. Um, the ACLU was supporting uh, the, the, the efforts to fight against this executive order. And within one hour, um, the ACLU website, which typically sees about 100 people go to their website a minute, um, spiked up to 4,000 people per minute, 4,000 um, hits. Um, and a site that typically brings in uh, 3 million a year, so ACLU gets 300, 3 million a year in donations, in one day got 25 million donations. And ACLU is on our platform. And uh, it was cool because I was on duty that weekend. Um, uh, by the way, if you want to follow along with me, I'm, I'm, this is deployed to um, Heroku. Um, so if you want to follow deploying um, PHP apps to, uh, to K8, you can follow me there. Um, but obviously, it's something like that that has a very low, um, low interest um, from, from our perspective most of the year to suddenly spike without ever going down. And it's really important um, that their business is up. They, never, they don't know, um, they, they couldn't possibly have predicted that. So that's the kind of problem space that we're in. Um, in this rich uh, 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to talk to you about what an anatom uh, the anatomy of a PHP app on G Google Cloud Platform. So it's not just um, Kubernetes. Uh, we, we're making full use of the Google Cloud Platform stack for a number of reasons that I won't get into. But um, I'll do a brief show and tell, brief, 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 um, enough to, that you won't even notice my mistakes. Um, and then I want to talk to you about, about discoveries I've made with Kubernetes and then um, lessons around um, container-centric architecture in, in this kind of space. OK, quickly, uh, uh, anatomy of a PHP app on GCP. I, I want to say quickly, um, I'm going to talk to you about um, PHP apps specifically, um, but our platform itself, the, the software that manages our platform, uh, is uh, Python, Node.js, um, a lot of Go. Um, and the, uh, the metaphors here uh, um, that we use for our client sites or are specialized for our client sites around PHP um, can also extend very easily to any app. <coughs> 
Oh, I'm going to cough really loud into this. Um, all right, so Google, you'll, you'll need a Google Cloud Platform account for this particular exercise, um, a Cloud SQL instance for persistence. <coughs> you'll have to spin up a container engine cluster. If you can all do this really quickly, um, uh, um, create a cloud uh, registry. And um, you'll need the gcloud command line tools. So essentially what I'm trying to say here is um, you, you're going to if you want to, if you want to follow along, if you want to do what I'm, I'm doing here, there's a lot of like clearing your throat work in terms of finding a, um, 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 all of all of these plugins. <coughs> but then you're going to need a container definition. So uh, we have a PHP app, so it makes sense that we have a very specific PHP Docker-based container. Um, in this particular example, I'm just using Google App Engine's um, base container. So this is uh, Google maintains base image. Uh, your base image for a container is um, crucial because, um, <coughs> Katie, you're here. Um, uh, the, your base image is essential because uh, this is your runtime environment. This is a good runtime environment. It has security updates. It has the right PHP version in it. Um, this is the LAMP stack that I want. <laughs> Thank you. I just, I just have a cold. Um, I'll have a cold out loud for all of you. Um, <coughs> and um, uh, for this particular example um, that you can uh, look at more closely over here on GitHub, um, this is uh, Krejci at um, D8 um, Kube. Um, I'm um, I'm going to, um, it, it's going to detect my composer lock, which is just like a package manager. A lot of applications have package manager, so, it, so I can have a very lightweight repository of just the composer lock. And it will run my composer install, run my package manager. I have some post install scripts, and I'm specifying an environment variable here. Um, this this um, particular container is really cool because I can bring my own web server um, overrides, so I can override some things for my Nginx conf. Um, so my web server can have some very specialized things. I can control it within my repository, and I can set some PHP INI um, overrides. This, is, this means that clients can have a very um, safe um, container base. So their container base can be um, they can trust that it that um, will have all of the security patches applied to it, um, but then they can override very specific windows of things that would be particularly relevant to their app. Let me just. All right. So then the deployment we have a so we have a container. We have defined what it's going to look like for my app to run within that contained space. Now what do I do with this? How do I get this onto the cloud? The workflow, um, and this is very similar for just about any kind of app, you build the artifact. The artifact is the container. The, the app that lives inside the container is the artifact of your deployment. Then you're going to push that artifact to a registry. In my example, I'm using Google Cloud's registry. There's other um, um, container registries. Docker has um, a container registry. Quay is another good um, registry. I'm pushing mine up to um, the, cl the cloud registry. And then I'm updating the reference to that artifact within my Kubernetes orchestration. K Kubernetes itself, and um, I, I actually, uh, it took me a moment to, un like, to understand this when I was first learning about Kube. Kube has nothing to do with containers per se. It's just an orchestration tool. It's just defining. A lot of nods here. Uh, maybe we've all had the dope moment, but um, just, just to make that clear, dope moment is over. Um, and then you apply the changes. Uh, more specifically, what that looks like, is you're going to build the thing, so Docker build my thing. Again, this is a, um, a Docker image with my app running inside of it, um, where um, uh, we'll get to that in a second. Um, so, so build the thing, build a Docker image, push the image. In this case, I'm pushing it to um, Cloud Registry. And then I'm going to be updating my kube deployment reference um, to point specifically to this number. All right, this is. Uh, this is a lesson learned here, but when I when I build um, when I build an image, I give it a number, an incremental number. I really like to use my um, uh, I, I use um, Circle CI as my continuous integration tool, and that has an environment variable for the build number. And I actually use the build number um, for the images that I create. 
and I really like that workflow. I do not like it when people reference the latest image um, because I don't have control over what's being referenced. Um, uh, I highly recommend that you're very specific about the name of your image and you tag it very specifically. I've, I, I really enjoy using the continuous integration um, build numbers. All right, so we're going to update um, our kube deployment and then we'll apply the changes and that's a part of the kube workflow. All right, this is another way of describing what I have just talked about. Over here on the left, these are your managed assets. This is what lives in my repository. This is the only thing that I need to worry about. This is my deployment. We'll take a, you can take a closer look on my um, GitHub repository since we don't have much time. Um, but this deployment YAML is what defines my containers. It defines my replica sets. Um, we'll take a closer look later. Um, up here is my service YAML. This is just a load balancer to describe a port of entry. Uh, not everything, uh, again, we're in serverless states, not everything is going to have a public entry point. Um, there's plenty of services that will only run internally, but with the Drupal app, it has a exposed port to the world. For that, I need a load balancer. So this is the only thing that exists inside my repository that defines what this is going to look like in the cloud. From there, when I push it, to um, with kube, it points to a, um, a SQL proxy, which helps me connect with Cloud SQL, which runs the Google Cloud Platform. It's a Drupal 8 app, which connects with Container Engine, and then there's a load balancer as a public entry point. Over here, this Google Cloud Platform doesn't need to be, this could be Azure, this can be um, AWS. Um, I'm happy, I happen to use um, Google Cloud Platform, but um, to give you a visual, this is what sits in your repository. This is what Kube does for you. And what happens here is a bring your own. Oh, a demo. OK. Here I am inside of my, uh, my, my Drupal 8. Uh, you can see that I wasn't lying to you. I've got my, my Nginx with me, my PHP INI. I have defined a deployment for this. Um, the coolest thing I can show you is, so this is my, this is my deployment. Um, I won't get too much into it, but it has a, can everyone see that okay? How does that look? Bit small or big? Do this if it needs to be bigger. Bigger, bigger. Good, all right, excellent. Thank you, thank you, sir. <coughs> all right, some highlights. It has um, two replicator sets. What that means is I'm going to need two, two of them. Um, and Kube is able to manage the, the, um, the load balancing of each of these. Um, the, um, there's, a, there's a rolling update. We'll take a look at that in a second, what that means. Um, but I can tell you uh, briefly that when I'm rolling out a deployment, um, I'm, I'm going to keep the old deployment running and um, uh, bring up one pod at a time. That means that um, I have an opportunity to make sure that the deployment is right. And if, the, if one of the deployments is failing, it still has um, a pod running, <coughs> um, a, le a legacy pod at that point running at the same time that the new pod is rolling out. And then I have two containers um, defined here. I have my uh, container that I just pushed to the Google Cloud Registry so this, is, this points to a very specific cloud registry. It has a tag. Um, again, in this case, I, um, I, I use the continuous integration build numbers, but here I have it hard-coded. I have exposed a port. Um, I will refer to that in my, um, in my load balancer. And then I also have another container for the um, cloud SQL proxy. Um, Drupal, WordPress, these PHP apps, they sit on top of the SQL store. And I'm using Cloud SQL as my SQL store. And in order for that to work, um, I need to create a, a proxy instance. So Google has a, um, a Google proxy uh, container that I can use to connect with their, um, with their Cloud SQL instance. All right, and then quickly, the load balancer, much easier. Um, the, 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 um, 
The load balancer is referring to a target port that I had aliased HTTP server in my deployment, and it just exposes port 80 to the public. It's pr pretty straightforward. All right. Definitely the most showy thing that I can show you with um, Kubernetes is to update the replicator set. So when I've just done, actually, what I've just done is I upped, upped the replicator set to three. Um, is that going to be showy enough? Probably not. Let's make it four. Take it to 11. Um, all right, so I, I, I don't need to rebuild my uh, container, thank God, because that takes forever. Um, because this is, yeah, anyway, that's another, another issue. So I'm not going to build the container. Let's let the container already exists. It's on um, Google Cloud. But I have made a change to Kube. Um, so I'm going to apply those changes. Um, that's what that command looks like um, to a namespace. We'll get to that in a second. <coughs> All right. Cool. So you, you see that it's um, starting to build a, uh, a fourth container, Cr creating a container. We could do watch to watch that go quickly, quickly, quickly. Um, so it's bringing everything up into a replicator set of four. If I were to have reduced it to two, it would bring it down to two. There's a lot more I can show you with, uh, like with replicator sets. Um, but the important thing um, here is to know that you can specify a policy about how you want things to expand and contract. One of my favorite things that Kube does is has something called a health check, which allows me to specify what it means for the container to be running. What does it look like for my container to be healthy? Which is extremely important for someone who works at infrastructure. How do I know that your app is running correctly? And um, being able to have that opportunity to have conversations about what it means to look like to run a healthy container um, and be able to auto scale according to what the health of the container looks like. Okay, we don't have time for, for um, anything else really. So, quickly back to some, some lessons learned. Um, some lessons learned from container-centric container architecture. The last group was, was talking a lot about all of the opportunities um, that, uh, that are opened up because of the possibilities of containers, because of the possibilities of, of being able to orchestrate containers at scale this way. Um, and, and some things that, um, that I've really taken from my experience um, really delving into containers and br then bringing it back to these um, PHP communities is the concept of production being an artifact of development. The, the, the repositories now that, that, um, that represent these apps are instructions on how to build an app. It didn't used to be that way, but now people's, uh, like my repository, for example, does not look like a working Drupal directory. What it looks like is a bunch of instructions to build a working Drupal directory. So it has Composer in it, which needs to run. People are compiling their, their SAS to CSS. There's, there's uh, grunt tasks and gulp tasks and, and make files. There's instructions on how to build the thing. And those that, that makes the development workflow amazing. It makes, it makes the repositories very developer-centric. But what you need to be able to do now is define a step in between developing the thing and actually serving up the thing. Um, and containers allow you to do that. Containers are the running, working runtime of your thing. Um, and being able to actually deploy an artifact, a stateless system, um, a stateless running system that is the product of development is uh, um, a huge aha moment. <coughs> and the, the problem of, you know, I, I had worked with Chef for a long time and Ansible and taking, taking A and, and having B changes to A and you have all of these things that needed to run, to run updates and you're running changes to a system on that system. Trying to make A B is extremely difficult and it fails most of the time. But just being able to replace A 
with B is extremely powerful, and it means I can undo it very quickly. A cool um, thing I wish I had a chance to show you with the demo is when a deployment fails, I can quickly un undo deploy, and in two seconds, I can re revert it back to the exact state that it had been before. I don't have to alter the state, I'm just, replace I'm just yeah, moving from A to B, and then B back to A without changing state. <coughs> it encourages a microservice thinking. The, the PHP um, world that I'm talking about here, uh, the, this content management system, this is a, a content-heavy world that's very monolithic. In, you know, Drupal is a monolith, WordPress is a monolith, but it doesn't want to be that way anymore. It's, it, it wants to be an API, it wants to be really good at, at managing just content, and, and now everyone wants everything else. They want you know, newsletters, event planning, uh, learning resources, and letting that PHP app be good at the thing that it's good at, and then using other services, other workers, observers, maybe using PubSub to get metrics, maybe connecting with a third-party um, resource, which is another thing that Kube allows you to do. It encourages this sort of um, Lego piecing together, um, and you don't need to rely on your one monolith anymore. And we're almost, I have one more slide, one more slide. No one's telling me to go, so that's where I'll just keep going. Okay, um, in, in, um, here are my favorite things about Kube. Whoops. Here are my favorite things about Kube. Everything is an object. It, it just blows I, every day. I'm like, oh, everything's an object. Namespaces are an object. Secrets are an object. Configuration management is an object. Um, namespaces, I, use, I, I was deploying to the Krejci namespace. I, I can also deploy, I can make namespaces at will. I name. I create namespaces based on pull request numbers so that every pull request deploys its own um, service and I can do integration testing on it. Um, I, use, I have a different project for the development space versus the, um, um, versus the production space. I already talked about rolling back. I already talked about health checks. All right, I'm done. Uh, thank, you, thank you so much. Oh, I, I have a question in the back. Maybe you can uh, tw tweet me. Right, cool, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Ransa. And there's something wonderful about a, a presentation that, I, again, it's so hard to cram what is meant to be kind of a 40-minute demo uh, into 20 minutes, so thank you so much. What's even better is that that entire demo, um, as you saw, was hosted, so any of you can follow along, can, can get those snippets of code, can like re-familiarize that yourself with your own pace. So you know, that's a talk that gives more than just the 20 minutes, um, and I've, I've tweeted the link, and obviously follow Samantha on Twitter because it, 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 it makes her feel all warm and and fuzzy, uh, that'd be that'd be wonderful. Okay, so next up um, we have Dan. If it can Dan give me a wave if he's if he's around. We appear to have lost Dan. Oh, there you are, good sir. No worries, couldn't see you in the back. That's absolutely fine. So uh, thought we'd take the tend the mood a little bit down here. Bit of a romantic vibe going on for for Dan's talk. <laughs> So again, we do a bit of light jazz, please. Now, money best. Yeah, yeah. You see, this is all good. I think um, you know. Let's let's say DevNet create version one. You know, in in beta, maybe a, a little gap in the schedule between speakers next time might be a a sensible piece of feedback. But we're all good. Yeah, no worries at all. Um, for anyone that didn't get the link from the previous um, from the previous talk, we're going to retweet it at DevNet Create. So again, if you want to follow on with that yourself or kind of go through all the material that, that was prepared for you there, um, you'll be able to do that at your own pace. Um, do we have any questions so far regarding you know, microservices, DevOps, um, the content, anything, anyone? Bit of an open Q&A moment. Clearly, everything has been explained in perfect clarity from start to finish. This is, this is exactly what we want. Yeah. 
This is not actually a back massage that comes free for, for all the speakers. He's actually getting his microphone all wired up. So. Probably worth mentioning as well. Um, looks like we are, we are almost good with the presentation. Um, Developer.cisco.com has a load of 24-7 um, uh, accessible learning labs, self-paced, kind of cover a load of topics we're talking about all the way through this conference, uh, from microservices to deployment to API basics to interfacing with hardware and buildings and IoT. Um, we've got a massive amount of content on there that's free for you guys to consume. So if you're interested in playing with Docker or understanding a bit more about Kubernetes or kind of learning like some REST basics or areas that you're not familiar with, definitely go and check those out at um, developer.cisco.com. You know, we've a lot of content there just to kind of back up um, all of the topics we're covering today and tomorrow. And without further ado, I will pass over to Dan. And let's see if I, yeah, and we have volume. Hey, I'm sorry about that delay. Uh, just a little confusion on the uh, schedule here. But let's um, dive in. Um, I just want to take a few minutes and walk you through a little bit of a story here. Um, this would actually have been perfect right before the prior presentation, because she was sort of giving you a lot of the details about how you would uh, use Kubernetes and why the cloud native platform uh, works. This is basically the question of uh, when should you use it? And it's sort of obvious to say, hey, if you're doing a new project from scratch today, then cloud native makes a ton of sense. But what I want to look into is, uh, can it work as well for existing legacy applications? So a uh, quick bra background, as we were saying at the keynote, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, part of the Linux Foundation, started about 18 months ago. We have Kubernetes, which is one of the highest velocity software projects in the history of uh, open source. But we also have all these other projects, including CNI, as of this morning. These are the platinum members, including Cisco, that back our work. The Linux Foundation, uh, you may be aware, is not just Linux anymore, but has really interesting uh, projects in blockchain, automotive-grade Linux, networking, uh, Let's Encrypt, which provides the majority of uh, certificates uh, to enable a, uh, a secure web. Okay, so um, CNCF uh, sees itself as being at a step in the history of the cloud, where you started with Sun uh, was the dominant company offering physical servers when that was the building block, then VMware with virtual machines, and then that going to Amazon Web Services with infrastructure as a service, and then Heroku, which we saw in the previous presentation, as platform as a service and this magic of being able to type a uh, git push Heroku. So the, all four of those companies were uh, closed source, then the next four are open source. So OpenStack, uh, which is essentially an open source version of VMware and Amazon Web Services. Cloud Foundry, uh, Abby spoke at the keynote this morning, uh, is an, uh, some, somewhat of an open source version of Heroku. They're, they're expanding from that. Docker was this massive change um, to have containers, to be able to containerize your application, arguably the fastest uh, adopted developer technology in history. And then in 2015, we have the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and Kubernetes. Okay, so this is this completely insane landscape chart that uh, talks about all the technologies in this space. And if you look at that URL down there, github.com slash cncf slash landscape, if your uh, product is, or company isn't on here, you can even put in and add to it. The ones circled in green are uh, are uh, the projects hosted by CNCF. And so the idea is that you pick the different projects from here. We know that our projects work well together and uh, interoperate, but you can also swap out other ones. And then you have this nirvana of cloud native. So uh, you avoided your lock vendor lock-in. So instead of, say, locking into AWS services or Azure services by using an open source cloud native stack, you can easily move between them. Uh, unlimited scalability, there's a statistic that Google, it's actually two years old, starts two billion containers per week. That's 3,300 a second uh, on average, but obviously their peak is way, way higher than that. Um, 
that uh, it allows increasing agility and maintainability. This is the idea of microservices where you split up your containers, although I do need to shout out to these pirates for how much work it must have been to get those containers into those ships. Um, and then uh, efficiency and resource utilization. So here's our orchestration that you uh, dynamically and manage and schedule your microservices and it allows you to achieve resiliency. So your container can fail, your machine, even entire data center, and uh, your system can automatically route around that. So cloud native has uh, really transformed a ton of organizations. These are some statistics from Puppet talking about high performing team that they do 200 times more frequent deployments. We heard in the keynote this morning of going from, uh, what was it, 12 or 18 months to deploy an app uh, to uh, to being able to do daily deploy or even dozens of times per day. And so things like three times lower failure rates, 24 times faster recovery from failures. So uh, this is this uh, wonderful image of how you should go build your greenfield applications that a cloud native architecture built on a stack like the one from CNCF is really the default way for uh, doing those, those greenfield applications today. Um, and I will make this specific pitch, Kubernetes is the leading choice for cloud native uh, orchestration. So lots of uh, amazing companies, Philips, Ticketmaster, Box, Comcast, New York Times, um, and it's, it's uh, one of the highest development velocity projects. You have this amazing group of technology giants and startups all working together, cooperating to make this better. Um, okay, so we're done. But I just want to give this quote, which I love, uh, from John Maynard Keynes. In the long run, we are all dead. Economists set themselves too easy, too useless a task. If in tempestuous seasons, they can only tell us that when the storm is long past, the ocean is flat again. And I love this phrase, too easy, too useless a task. And I want to make the, the argument that that's really the case on looking just at greenfield applications because the real world consists of brownfield applications. The statistic for the gross world product is it's about $100 trillion, and I would argue that essentially all of that, at least 99%, flows through brownfield applications, uh, which are generally monoliths. And so when you, uh, even if you think of a, a really forward-moving company like a Google or a Yelp or something that's totally containerized, their payroll system, all of these other back-end systems that they're probably using to move money around are still stuck in monoliths to a huge degree, um, and will be in, until uh, people can evolve off of them. So um, monolith, not the uh, 2001 kind, uh, but the idea is that cloud native hasn't been around that long, um, that uh, the traditional way of doing it is you would hire a team, you would pick a language or framework like Java and Spring or PHP app, and as you added features, as uh, new demands came in, it would just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and you found that making any change uh, required a huge amount of coordination with a lot of other folks. So now, uh, the point of this talk, how do we evolve out of that? And the simple, obvious answer is, well, let's just rewrite it. Um, you know that there's all this cruft uh, along. It didn't, doesn't use the most modern techniques. It probably doesn't have very good test coverage. And um, this book, uh, The Mythical Man Month, and particularly the concept it uh, portrayed or, or named for the first time, Second System Syndrome, says that um, that's probably not going to work. Now, you know, for some amount of effort, you always could do a rewrite, but the challenge is that your competitors are moving along and they're adding features and making improvements and, and uh, removing bugs, and you are not because all of your engineering resources are going to just recreating the functionality that was already there in a new system. And the, the bigger issue is that as that's happening, there are absolutely urgent firefighting things that you have to go do in your first system. And so the first system is not a fixed target. It winds up being a moving target. And there, unfortunately, there are just tons and tons of stories, particularly government acquisition, but also lots of uh, big business implementations, acquisitions, where uh, they just run out of money and wind up scrapping the second system entirely and move back to living with the first. Okay. So um, monoliths are the antithesis of cloud native. They're inflexible, they're tightly coupled, they're brittle. What is a path? And um, my background image here 
is giving a hint, which is uh, you have this, uh, the first step is to lift and shift your monolith. Um, and so uh, let's say you have a massive Java application that requires eight gigabytes of, um, of RAM to run, or um, actually one of my favorite examples is Ticketmaster, who's a uh, end user supporter in CNCF, and uh, they had a mini computer code, and they were able to get a PDP-11 emulator running inside of a Docker container and get that old code uh, running reliably in a containerized environment. So the very first step is that you take whatever that project is and you wrap it in a container. And ideally, you have a set of CI and CD, a continuous integration, continuous deployment that goes with that so that you can make changes to it. Essentially, it's a requirement. That you can make changes to it and that uh, you get a new container um, out of that. But it's still this massive piece that's not in any way flexible. You're not really getting any of the benefits yet. Um, in principle, you could just lift and shift this up to a public cloud or to your own private cloud, but uh, my argument is that really the first sta step is to containerize it. And I'll mention a specific feature of Kubernetes called stateful sets, uh, which was formerly known as pet sets, that's very useful for this, where once you containerize it, you can essentially glue it back to the machine or set of machines that you wanted to run it on. So just because it's in a container doesn't mean that it's moving all around or that you um, are not sure uh, how it's being allocated. And then, and this is really the key thought, you start chipping away at the monolith. And so instead of constantly adding new features uh, to that uh, existing project, you find uh, new, you take the functionality and put it uh, away. So Ticketmaster, as I mentioned, uh, they have a situation where essentially every concert announcement represents a distributed denial of service attack. They um, ha have this deadline, they have an enormous number of people uh, connecting in simultaneously. When they're able to replicate the front end servers out, it gives them a much better position to be able to uh, deal with that. Um, but the uh, bigger piece is that as you need to add in new functionality, you don't add it to your monolith, you write new microservices. And uh, what's fantastic about this is that those microservices don't need to be in the same language or with the same framework or using the same library dependencies as your uh, existing monolith. And so uh, if, it's a Node, if you need to add OAuth capability, maybe you do that in Node.js. If you have a really performance sensitive, maybe you write that in Go. And there's a great example from a key bank in North Carolina where they had a bunch of jo monolithic Java applications. It was incredibly difficult for them to make changes to it. Um, they put a set of Node.js front end servers in front of it that just added a ton of flexibility on how they were able to um, provide the, the back end to their, uh, their iOS and their Android apps. And so um, the idea is that uh, yes, you might need to retrofit. Essentially, every le ma monolithic legacy application has some API, whether it's a terminal type with, um, to a mini computer or something uh, like a SOAP or an XML RPC or ideally REST, but in some way it has an API, you can write your new apps and have it speak to that instead of continuing to add all that functionality into the monolith. And then um, sometimes, uh, Chipping away isn't enough, you need a chainsaw. So um, the argument here is that you want to start with your stateless servers. Um, there's a good example of MediaWiki, where um, folks are familiar with that. It's probably it's a PHP app uh, that's incredibly uh, you know, popular, widely used. Um, the back end is MySQL. And the reality for Kubernetes and all the other orchestration platforms today is that they are not uh, a perfect match with MySQL and with other kinds of uh, regular databases. And so what uh, 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 Wikipedia MediaWiki uh, is doing, excuse me, Wikimedia Foundation is doing, is uh, they put their PHP application servers into Kubernetes in order to be allow them to be resilient, auto-scaling, other functionality. They're leaving the MySQL server on its own dedicated machine. And uh, there's interesting opportunities out there. There's projects like Vitesse, which came out of um, 
YouTube and is essentially a fork of MySQL that enables sharding. There's CockroachDB. There's a lot of innovation happening in the space, but uh, the claim is definitely you want to start with the stateless piece and really go to the, the data stores uh, last. And so there are um, interesting opportunities to look at, but uh, it's not the, the advantage of, of switching it is not there. And then uh, my other pitch to you is to consider some of the complementary projects, including the ones at CNCF. Um, so just quickly, Prometheus is um, an incredibly popular uh, full-featured monitoring app and alerting. Open tracing, um, there's a uh, sense in which uh, there's a, a famous tweet on this that debugging a microservices application it can be like solving a murder mystery. And open tracing is a framework that allows all your different applications to provide data to allow you to figure it out. FluentD is a universal logging uh, system that talks to 300 different kinds of applications. Linkerd is a service mesh. As things get more complicated and you need that capability to uh, route dynamically based on load, based on geography, based on other kinds of requirements, Linkerd can help do that. gRPC is an incredibly powerful uh, remote procedure call framework that's being used today in Containerd and uh, Rocket and Prometheus and Kubernetes and others, but you can use it as well. It's essentially the question of if you're using JSON REST as your API and you're finding that you're starting to run into performance challenges, uh, then you very much want to look at swapping out uh, and, uh, that for gRPC. Core DNS is for service discovery and uh, will likely be replacing cube DNS before long. Container D and Rocket are two uh, core building blocks, runtimes. Container D is the, the runtime used in Docker. And then as we announced today, CNI is a standard for being able to plug in different uh, networking technologies. So Contiv from Cisco is a good option. And then uh, WeaveNet, Flannel, and Calico are the others that are best known. And eventually, when you shave away enough pieces here, you uh, have your beautiful ice sculpture, and ideally maybe even a menagerie of uh, dozens of different microservices that your monolith has been split up into different pieces um, without possibly ever being erased. Uh, Grover Norquist has a phrase about the federal government that he wants to get it uh, small enough that he can strangle it in a bathtub. Um, I think many of us feel that way about monoliths that we've had to work with, but uh, it's always a decision on, hey, is it really worth doing the, f the work here to finally replace it or not? Um, or can we just make it smaller and smaller over time? So um, my claim for Kubernetes and Greenfield is that we want to avoid uh, this phrase, the soft bigotry of low expectations of thinking that you have to do a Greenfield rewrite in order to get the benefits of cloud native, that actually a lot of them are available to you in an evolutionary path. And my claim particularly is that Kubernetes loves brownfield applications and that uh, a lot of the companies that are getting the biggest value from it today have not rewritten uh, their work. So uh, I'm going to share this uh, deck, and it'll be available through Cisco, but here's just some links to uh, Box, Ticketmaster, and KeyBank are all interesting stories where they had monoliths or, or much bigger things and how they've evolved it, worked with Kubernetes into real cloud-native services. And um, I finally just want to give a quick pitch uh, that we're the big uh, KubeCon, uh, cloud-native con event will be uh, in Austin in December. And uh, right now we have... Uh, Request for papers open, but we'd love to uh, to see many of you there if you want to learn more about this space. It's really the best place in the world to go. Um, and finally, here is uh, my email and uh, Twitter handle. I also uh, get flattered when people uh, follow me. Um, and with that, I uh, will stop. And I think I might have time for just one uh, or two questions if if folks have any. It's got to be someone somewhere. I think those sandwiches were a bit too hot. Yeah, here that's fine. Uh, <laughs> plus the the dark lighting. But uh, I'll st oh. Sorry, go on. There you go. <laughs> are there any interesting? Yeah. Are there any interesting yeah. developments yeah, in breaking up the uh, the database? That always seems to be the. The mass that nobody oh, I, I think there's definitely advantages to breaking up the database. Um, I just think it's a much less mature, well-understood uh, process today. So 
I'd say the, the two big approaches that um, are the sort of obvious ones are, if you're willing to go into the cloud and just outsource your database entirely to your cloud provider, then uh, Amazon, uh, Azure, Google, all have fantastic offerings that will give you an insane number of nines and and uh, let you kind of forget about it. A lot of bigger companies aren't comfortable with that, don't want to store their data in the cloud, don't want to lock in to a, a specific provider. So uh, there's a company in the cloud native space called uh, Cockroach Labs that has a project CockroachDB. And it's based by a lot of the folks who worked on uh, Google's Spanner database. Nice. And it literally just hit 1.0. Um, like last week, and so I don't quite recommend it yet for uh, your production data, but I think it's a really interesting approach that's very worth um, following. And then I mentioned uh, Vitesse, which is a, a fork of MySQL, and um, there's a number of uh, others. Another one is RethinkDB has always had a kind of cluster-oriented, um, and it's designed to be uh, to work well with Kubernetes and other clustering systems. My, my claim is that it's the least mature part of the space. And so it's really worth beginning to make your investments into cloud native now, but um, maybe not to do the, the database piece quite yet. Sure. Any other questions? Got time for one more? Oh, oh over there. You've got 21 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> um, as someone who's trying to convince the uh, leadership, kiss it though. That uh, yeah. someone who's trying to convince the leadership that um, microservices it would be a better alternative than a ground-up rewrite of a monolithic application. Mm -hmm. Could you suggest some resources or use cases um, that we could refer to to explain to non-technical people how the, the containerized uh, architecture would be preferable and more ultimately profitable than? Yeah. A rewrite. So the answer is we're working on it. If you go to Kubernetes.io and click on case studies, there's a number of good ones there. We have a bunch more coming up, like just in the next uh, couple months. So if you could please keep going back. But the question is how to convince people that this is the right approach. The, the biggest argument for microservices I'll make is, is a cultural one and an organizational one, which is that uh, trying to get everybody to use the same language and the same framework and the same library versions for everything is just incredibly hard. Especially, obviously, I mean, it's fine, you know, if your team's 15 or 20 people, but beyond that, it just gets harder and harder to get people to agree on it. And so the magic of microservices is when you have a group that wants to go off and do something or even just try something and maybe it's not going to work, that you don't have to say no to them, no this is the framework we use, we're still on Java 6, we're still doing this and this, they can actually go off and try newer stuff. And just culturally, that ability to allow different teams to uh, be working on, on platforms that are optimized for them, but still interoperate, is, is really magical. And I think uh, you've seen from basically every technology company out there that that's the direction that they've gone. The, the most classic example, by the way, is Twitter, where they started with a Rails monolith, and they're up to something like a thousand different services now when they, when they realized that that single approach couldn't scale. But uh, we need more, more data on it. So um, I'll stop there. Thank you all very much for, uh, for taking a look, and please do follow up with me if I could, uh, could be of help. Thank you. Mr. Yeah. Hello. Thank you very, very much. Sir. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> no, no. There we go. Thank you Appreciate very, very much. Um, I think I think what's great there as well um, is you know w we heard it kind of mentioned in the panel as well. Um, a long time, you know, purists conversations I've always had. You know, when Docker was first becoming a thing, when it was gaining traction, you've got all this. Ah, oh, you know, you can't just dump your existing monolith in a Docker container. You know, that's not a microservice. That's you know, that's you don't want to do that. Well, actually, what's really interesting here is you know. The, the honeymoon period of playing with Hello World and, and simple greenfield applications or complex greenfield applications is kind of, you know, giving way to this thought of, well, actually, yes, it's not a microservice, but there are advantages to dumping your existing monolith in a container to getting it onto that same platform so that at least at the platform level, you have like one infrastructure to deal with as you start carving those pieces out rather than two. And it's just a really interesting change in the way people are thinking there that yes, it's not a microservice, but actually containerizing is, is a really good first step. Anyway, thanks again, Dan. Um, and last but by no means least, um, we have Sam who's here to talk to us about um, 
his experience with actually writing um, high-performance fault-tolerant software. Um, so just to take it a little bit deeper now um, into the software writing process itself. And uh, we're all mic'd up, so we are likely ready to go. Has everyone enjoyed this track, by the way? So far, good. Thank you so much for all of our speakers. Um, if you haven't liked this track, I'm at Matt-J on Twitter, M-A-T-T-D-A-S-H, letter J. Horrible Twitter handle, should have thought of something better many, many years ago. Um, but by all means, you know, do comments, feedback for DevNet Create in general, thoughts on this track, how we can make it better for, for next year. Thank you very much, and I'll hand over. Thank you, Matt. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is, oh, I'm already on my second slide. There you go. So what today we'll be talking about is how to build a fault-tolerant software uh, when, you're, when your platform is depending on a lot of less uh, available components. So a lot of what we talked about today already is how can we leverage Kubernetes and, and, other, uh, and other tools to help uh, set up your, your infrastructure, how to make sure you have self-healing, how to make sure your internal failures are being accounted for. The idea is that a lot of the tools out there today, as uh, we're, we're moving in a world of interconnected web, rely on other tools to be available online. And uh, it becomes more and more important that we build software that is accounting for uh, faults from providers it's depending on. Uh, so th this work has, is inspired by a lot of what we do at Shippo. Shippo is, a, is an API that allows you to connect to a lot of uh, carrier APIs. So if you want to buy labels from FedEx or USPS to, create, to send your shipments, you only have to integrate our API and we'll connect you to hundreds, sorry, tens at this point of, of carriers where you can uh, print, labels, print labels to ship globally. We also connect a lot of platforms to help your fulfillment needs. So if you want to send information to your customers where uh, once a label is printed and is, is on the way, they can get tracking updates, we'll also connect to those platforms. So between carriers and, and shopping platforms and, and merchant platforms, we have hundreds of, of, of uh, platforms that we're connecting to. And uh, any downtime with those platforms could affect our system. So um, we had a lot of work to do in this department. So again, my name is Wussam. I'm an engineer at Chippo. I started off as a security engineer uh, uh, on, on the box security team. Really loved it. Uh, got a chance while I was there to work with the SRE team. I had a great SRE team. I got a, le a lot to learn from them. And um, ever since I fell in love with uh, DevOps philosophy, I, call I like calling it the philosophy because uh, all software engineers should be you know, in the habit of deploying their codes uh, from the first line all the way to production. Um, and if uh, things don't work out for me, um, my plan B has always been to join the NBA, although I'm not sure I'm in shape anymore for that. Uh, anyway, love coconut water as well. Highly recommend it to get it fresh uh, if, you ever, if you ever make a trip to, to Hawaii. Cool. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about the problem. The problem, as I mentioned, is um, you're, you're a service provider, and you rely on uh, tens or so of third-party providers to uh, provide the functionality that you offer for the customers. So in our case, if any of the carriers that we de depend on are, are, is down, or any of the merchant platforms is down, uh, we simply can't um, fulfill our client's needs. A minute of downtime on, at, at Shippo means, you know, imagine you're, a, you're checking out on Amazon, and all of a sudden you're trying to get the shipping rates and uh, you, don't get, you can't get those. Or Amazon obviously sometimes includes some of those prices, but any of your other merchant favorite uh, online store, uh, imagine you simply uh, got to check out and you got stuck there. You're never buying from them again, right? So it's a really big deal to make sure uh, we get this right for our customers. And um, here's, here's the gist of the problem. Just, just very simply put, you start off with uh, you know, your client trying to use your service. Your service is offering is Guaranteeing your client four nines of uptime. This is a little ambitious, but let's, uh, let's go with that. Um, at a point where you're depending on only two third-party providers, if you're saying you might be down for one minute for each minute, either of them is down, you really need both of them to be up for four nines as well, which is quite a bit to ask out of a lot of the third-party providers that are outdated out there and working with legacy infrastructure, but maybe it's something you can work with. However, as we try to integrate more and more third parties, you'll notice that this number starts to quickly go up. So four nines is 4.2 minutes. Uh, this is almost five nines, which is a little less than half a minute. So it becomes really, really difficult. And this is only for eight providers. You go up to 16, you go up to 32. Now it's becoming impossible to rely on your third party providers to stay up as much as you need them to, to make sure that you are also up for your customers. 
So this is where you have to get a little creative and um, figure out what you need to do. So let's, let's talk about the solutions. As, as we're talking about the solutions, let's first see what the industry has, what are the first things we've done in the industry to kind of address this problem. Um, as you can see here, you know, obviously uh, you have a load balancer that's load balancing your client's request to a bunch of front-end workers. And one of the main things we've done in the industry is uh, we've isolated the work of processing the request from the work of talking to third-party providers. So front-end workers are queuing up uh, the work for the uh, back-end workers that are in turn responsible for, for uh, communicating with the third-party providers. You can assume that you have um, some timeouts on how much, you know, if the third-party provider is taking a long time to uh, respond, you can assume you have a, I, I, I was very specific here, I put in a connect timeout and read timeout just because they actually, you know, can be very helpful to separate. So let's say a total of just over eight seconds timing out when sending requests to a third-party provider. Uh, well, you know, this helps, obviously, it'll mitigate, you know, you don't have to wait 30 seconds for a request and you manage your resources, uh, but it's still not, not enough. And the reason being is that in this setup, usually you have a setup such that all of your background workers can talk to all third-party providers. Now, remember, the premise of this service is that one can buy, in Shippo's instance, the label from uh, FedEx or USPS, I, you know, not to name specific areas, I don't want to I put anybody in a bad light, but you know, for, for, um, the idea is that if I want to buy a label from FedEx uh, or USPS, if one of them is down, I should still be able to buy a label from the other. But with this simple architecture, this is actually not enough. Because if one third-party provider goes down, now all of your background workers are actually stuck processing requests for that third-party provider. And at this point, you don't have any more resources where you can process requests to the other third-party provider. So that's becoming problematic. Uh, to your client. N now you're actually more down than if your client had integrated the good, the healthy third-party provider, excuse me, the healthy third-party provider directly. Uh, so what is the first thing you do? It's actually very simple. If it's a, you know, once you see that diagram, you say, oh, okay, well, all we have to do is separate, separate out. So now if a third-party provider is down, um, only the dedicated resources for that third-party provider will be affected. And here's why that's okay. You know, with today's uh, infrastructure as code tools, Kubernetes, uh, Terraform, this is actually not that very difficult to instrument. You could easily set up, uh, you know, if you're using a queuing mechanism, you could easily set up a broker and a new queue for all your new workers per each provider that you integrate. So this gives you great granularity to control how your resources are being spent. And couple that with auto-scaling auto techniques, you're not really uh, wasting any resources. So one could say, well, suppose most of my requests are going to this provider and none of them are going to this provider. Well, very simple. Let's just auto scale and it'll solve the problem for you. Cool. Well, we can still do a little bit better than that because, you know, there's one thing between a third party being down and um, it's just being slow. If it's being slow, we're happy just, sp you know, spending some resources to kind of make sure um, we process all these requests. But if the part is actually completely down and we know this, then we actually don't want to spend any of these resources. Matter of fact, it's probably hurtful for us to keep sending requests to the third party because they're probably down a lot of times because they're having to process too many requests. So if anything, we want to help and retract some of our own requests. So how can we do this? So, you know, the concept behind this is just simply to fail fast. You already know the provider is, is down, so you could respond to your customer letting them know, well, this carrier is down, you can't buy a label from them at the moment. You could buy a label from X, Y, and Z. Uh, and the way to do this is, um, so again, this is the same diagram. The idea is that how could we just save the resources uh, over here? And uh, the way to do this is using circuit breakers. So this is a picture of the circuit breaker in my house. And the idea is that anytime the current in the circuit is going too high, uh, the circuit breaker en engages and opens the circuit. This way, it's making sure that uh, the electricity system is, is not too dangerous. And we can do this, use the same technique in software and in, 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 uh, in architecture where, um, where what we do is once we realize that a provider has had too many errors, we simply stop sending requests to it until it recovers. Once it recovers, we're, uh, we're sending requests again. And that's what this would look like. So the circuit breaker starts off in the connected state. In the connected state, it's informing your application that the provider is good, you know, you can send all the requests that you need to it. Um, 
at some point, a third-party provider is exceeding some configurable threshold that you've set up for error rates, where uh, it's responding with 500, it's simply timing out all the time. Uh, at that point, whatever is your configurable threshold, the um, circuit breaker switches to offline, disconnects, and now it's informing your application to stop sending requests. So what this means is that, let's, let me go back quickly to this slide, this means that at this point, your front end already knows that it doesn't need to queue up any work. All it needs to do is respond to the user and ask, ask, you know, suggest that maybe the user uses a, a different provider or that they try again at a later time. Obviously, depending on your product, there are a lot of other things that you can do to get creative. You know, we'll, we'll touch on that in a second. So once uh, the circuit break is in the offline state, you can configure it to do uh, some thinking health checks, which is something we talked about earlier uh, for setting up your Kubernetes uh, swarm. Uh, you could actually use this for anything that, that in one way or another supports it. Now, the key thing to remember here is a uh, third, profi third party provider is down, so you don't want to swarm them with a lot of requests, but you do want to get an idea as soon as possible of when they're back up. And now as soon as they're back up, you start informing your app the application that uh, it's okay to send requests to the third party provider. And that's what this eventually looks like. So you, you insert a circuit breaker between your front-end workers and your back-end workers, and uh, the front-end is able to consult with a, with a circuit breaker before it goes ahead and queues up work for the background workers. Um, so why, why is this really important? This is really important because in many cases, one of the core th big things you can do is obviously have failover for the third parties that you provide. So you know, if you don't want to buy a label from, if you can't buy a label from USPS, you can buy a label from FedEx. Uh, that's not something you can do if, if USPS is down, then your entire system is down. So the first really important thing to do is to make sure you're isolating downtime of the components you're relying on from your own downtime. And as you can see, this could be a med levels. And only at that point will you be able to, as we mentioned earlier, uh, add failover providers or do other things in your product where you can tell your customers we'll retry later for you and, and, and let you know. So you could use webhooks on that for that matter. A customer could simply post a request You'll process it at your own time uh, whenever it makes sense, obviously, as long as, me as it meets uh, the client's needs. And you'll post a webhook back to the client. In that example, the client itself would also be a provider where if you're posting a webhook and actually waiting on their, on their response, then uh, you know, if their platform is slowing down, they could actually take you down as well. So uh, it, you'll want to follow the same model with that as well. So all in all, if you put it all together with with isolation, what you get is fault tolerance. So every time one of the third-party providers is going down, you can tolerate those faults. Um, with Circuit Breaker, it gives you better, better resource utilization where you're not spending uh, cycles trying to process requests for a provider that you know is down. Uh, put them together, you have lower latency or at least uh, higher throughput. So a lot of times a client is putting up a request, sending requests, and polling for the results. Or they're sending requests and actually waiting on the result. Either way, you'll have higher throughput with, with those two techniques. And eventually, those two allow you to add failover uh, providers um, efficiently, which will give you higher availability down the line. Um, yeah. And that's, so we've, uh, we've applied this at Chippo. Uh, I believe for um, most of our providers have their own dedicated queues and, and, uh, and workers. And hence, if any of them is down, we're, you know, we're barely affected. All we have to do is inform our customers, which is automatically taken care of at this point. Uh, and the good news is we're able to provide for all our customers better than the service that each of our providers is actually providing uh, at the moment. So yeah. That's it for me. I actually think I have quite a bit of time. I might have gone through this pretty fast. Yeah, I have like five minutes if anybody has any questions. Uh, I've got mic number six. Yeah, I noticed that you, you mentioned about Circuit Breaker. Are you using like Netflix hysterics? No, it's actually a, a, our own um, homegrown Circuit Breaker. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, this is, uh, I think it was this one. Yeah. Like those kind of questions. That was good. Um, any more? Oh. We've got a few minutes. Sorry. Anyone else? Oh. Nope. Oh, right here. Oh, right over there. Could not be further away from my current position. There you go. Yeah. Uh, so, quick follow-up question: Why did you make your own circuit breaker? Uh, honestly, at the time, I, I think I just didn't do enough uh, research in the market about uh, what's out there, and I was—I had 
I'd read about it, about it uh, in a few of the literature that I've, that I've encountered. Um, I decided to do it myself, but uh, it's, a, it's a simple concept. Um, once you spend enough time on it. Any more? Oh, yep. Yeah, I, again, could I swear you guys are doing this on purpose now. <laughs> Who was it? Sorry. Yes, sir. There you go. Uh, it's just a follow up on um, how the third party API, when, when it comes break up and it comes back up, mm -hmm. um, how do you find out? Do you, do you have to continuously poll? Because the third party may not have any health check API. Yeah, so what we do right now is uh, we have some requests that we know are, so we've communicated with most, most third party providers that we talk to what requests are less, uh, uh, that ca cause less load on their system, but still touch their application code enough so that, so that they, uh, there would be a good demonstration of whether or not um, their system is back up, and that's what we've instrumented. So a lot of a lot of what we have right now with the providers that we use, they're quite uh, you know old school uh, APIs, so they don't really have status status health that you can check for. So some of some of our health checks are actually API calls that are um, either important, so repeating them is not really causing an issue. Uh, but also, most more importantly, they're not causing too much load on the third party provider we're communicating with. Okay, so we have a use case where it's kind of payment related, so we can't have any anything other than uh, you know payments go through. So in that case, you know, what do we do? So for payments, uh, so for payments, obviously, you can't you know charging is not something you want you want to stay away from. Um, some some of the APIs that you could try is adding adding um trying to add a a payment type and seeing if uh, if you're getting an application application error level level error or or a, uh, or a load balancer level error. Uh, if you're getting an application level error, at least your request is being processed by the application. Give you some idea. And obviously, something else to take into account here is not just uh, what the response codes are, but also how much time is it taking. Guys. Um, so if it's, if it's going past the timeout uh, period that you have, then obviously it's not, it's not succeeding. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's in the lines of, you know, what are we doing right now? Thank you. Sorry? Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Nope, going once, going twice. Um, big round of applause, please. Um, Thank you, everybody. And that concludes our um, microservices track. I uh, hope you've all enjoyed it. Um, like I said, more resources on everything you've kind of learned here at developer.cisco.com. Um, if you're inclined, a uh, load of learning resources to check out and uh, enjoy your break. Thank you very much. <laughs>